And joining us now is Dr. Heidi Anderson, president of the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Dr. Anderson, thank you for joining us. Well, you're very welcome, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here today, especially virtually. Uh, enjoying that, and we'll have to do it in person one of these days. I agree, we will. Now, for people not familiar with UMES, that'll require a bit of a drive for somebody living on the Western Shore over the Bay Bridge and then head south for a little bit. Tell, tell us about the history of the location because you are a 1890 land grant. Tell us about that. Jeff, I'm so happy that you asked me about that. Let's, talk, let's start with that Bay Bridge part. So you're correct. If you're here in the state of Maryland and driving over, you come across the Bay Bridge. Eventually you come across like five different bridges and then you land in a place called Princess Anne, Maryland. We are so picturesque. And I have to tell you, we attract our students by telling them we're so close to the ocean, you can get there in less than an hour and you really can. We are in the middle of this Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic Ocean and about 35 miles from each, which means we are surrounded by water in a sense. Our town of Princess Anne is a very small town. So we're very rural, but it's beautiful over here. And we're having wonderful weather these days. Our students and fa faculty really love that. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I've heard the phrase land grant institution forever. Mm -hmm. And I, I honestly don't know the history. Let me see if I can share that with our viewers and with you. Land grant institutions really came about uh, in, in the 1800s. And you have two types. There is 1865 land grants. And those are really what we consider PWIs, the, the predominantly white institutions. So in our state, that's College Park. Then in 1890, more land was given for institutions to develop universities. And those were given to the HBCUs, the historically black colleges and university. So in some states, you have both of those. In many states, you only have one. And we are a proud 1890 HBCU land grant here in the state of Maryland. The other thing I like to share with your viewers about land grants, it implies a couple things. It means that you really focus on not just teaching and service, but also extension and really engaging with your community. And so for example, here at UMES, we have become what people know as a STEM university, science, technology, engineering, and math. But I like to think of us as a STEAM institution, science, technology, engineering, agriculture, aviation, arts, and math. And that gets the STEAM in there. So you cover the breadth of that. And then the last thing I'll say about land grants is our mission and purpose is to help solve problems, the problems that are in your community, the problems that are globally, for example, problems with waterways. Since we are surrounded by Atlantic Ocean and Chesapeake Bay, we work on solving those problems that really impact fisheries or the ecosystem or the problems with food shortages from our agriculture side. There are food shortages throughout the state of Maryland and throughout the world. And so what we're working with is trying to solve those. So I have faculty and staff here who are doing edible bugs. Think about that. And I've eaten some of them, but everywhere you can find bugs and they're working on how to turn that into something that can be solving the food shortage and giving you protein. How, and how's that going over in the, uh, the dining hall? Mm, you have to ask our students that one. <laughs> well, let's talk about the, the students for a minute and the um, degree programs that, that are most attractive to, to them right now. I mean, in the ivory tower, we, we can decide, you know, we're going to focus on these areas, but ultimately the, the young people are going to elect to, to major in what they're interested in, right? They really do. And, and these days they're, they're all over the map in their interests and we can, we can, uh, we have a lot that they can, we can offer, but I'll tell you our students, 60% of our students now in the last few years have been majoring in the sciences that STEM that I mentioned, and of course our agriculture area. But we also have eight health professions that our students are attracted to with us. We are the only HBCU that has this many health professions. So pharmacists, physical therapists, physician assistants is our newest, latest one. And think about that and connecting it back with that land grant. It helps us solve the problems of healthcare and health disparities that's in the state and in the country. 
Let me ask a wide open question. Just your thoughts on the future of HBCUs, the future of UMES, or, or some combination of those questions. I think the future of HBCUs is very bright, Jeff. I, many of our students are, are realizing that they want to come to an environment that they have individuals who look like them. And that is something that's attracting a lot of our students, whether they are, are African-American, whether they are Hispanic, but looking at our schools to be able to have those role models who are there on a day-to-day -day basis. And that really helps, helps them grow and helps them mature. The plans for UMES, let me give a shout out on this one. Because of the uh, efforts of Speaker Adrian Jones and also President Ferguson with SB1 and HB1 in the legislative session, they looked at that and said, hey, we need to move forward with what we're doing to our HBCUs. So with the funding that has come from that, we are thrilled that that's going to help us not only grow some of our academic programs, but get out there and do some marketing about our campus and really expand our research uh, infrastructure as well. So I appreciate that from them. And then our students are going to see some new programs, some new academic programs from that funding. One school is introducing gaming, artificial intelligence, simulations, and those type of things. And this, that will expand our program mix. Lastly, it's, it's been a bumpy couple of years for everybody in education at, at every level. What are you looking for as, as students return for the new semester? Oh, I'm looking for that energy. <laughs> Students, when they're, when, they can't, when they're not here, the campus is so empty. And when they get back, it is so energized. They, it really is true when, they say, when we say that uh, the students keep us feeling young. So I'm looking forward to that. And the fact that this year, I can actually recognize my students because the masks are optional <laughs> if you, from a social responsibility standpoint. But we will make sure we keep them safe. And so we're going to still have our vaccine clinics and our testing as needed. And if things change with whether it's monkeypox or, or COVID, we will be ready to pivot in a, in a moment. Dr. Heidi Anderson joining us from the beautiful Lower Eastern Shore. Dr. Anderson, thank you very much. Well, you're very welcome.